we've been working on this for about a week or so to try to give you our playbook and to what we look at with, as Tuscaloosa Marine Shale from an investment opportunity and some of the sources we use to go to to figure out what's going on out there. Okay, there's a variety of, of different websites and things like that. So half of my talk is going to be breezing through some of these websites, including uh, what's on your sheet in front of you. Okay, this is your little cheat sheet to take home. This will also be on our website. Our website's not very developed right now because uh, we've we've been in the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale for about four or five months, and we've been so busy, we really haven't developed much of a website. We've been actually working with the TMS Horizons website to try to design something to take uh, to take advantage of and, and to work with all of the leads that come in to Tommy, Tommy's website here. So we got together with Tommy, I guess, about a month or so ago and, and started figuring out what we're going to do with these people who want to get leased or sell their minerals or sell their royalty, and it's been a little bit kind of trying to drink water out of a fire hydrant because there's a lot of a lot of talent coming through the door for various reasons you know we, we we've done different things with different folks on that but this is a this is a list of, of the different links I'm going to go through quickly during the first half of my talk today the second half is going to be on how do you turn your minerals or royalty uh, into money you know um, there's a variety of ways you can wait and wait for the production payments to come in and I'm going to tell you, I mean, the Sanchez person apparently went over how to calculate your mineral interests and what, what your check stub should be, and I'm going to go over some of that too, and leave you, I hope, with an understanding of the basics of the math involved, which uh, confounds us all in our office while I'm trying to teach everybody, but it's very, it's pretty simple once you have the formulas, okay, and you understand what the terms are. So, um, I'm not, I'm an attorney, but I'm not here to, to, to give you any legal advice, okay? I'm a, a Louisiana lawyer. I, uh, I don't really practice law per se. I, I'm, I'm, we've run a land consulting shop for the last, uh, you know, 30 years or so. My old friend Rich Price is here from New Orleans here, and he's uh, I've known him a long time, and he does a lot of similar things. So, um, a little bit about what we do. Um, we primarily work in the offshore Gulf of Mexico, and we, we provide information to folks who, all the companies that work in the federal portion of the Gulf. So everybody from BP to Shell to Exxon to every company that works out there. I've, primarily it's through software that we developed and through internet services that we have that are fully diversified for the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico doesn't have anything to do with here. It's a totally different deal, okay? Um, a lot of the, a lot of the nomenclature and the, 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 the language is the same, but it's just a totally different functioning environment. We're in a shale play here. So um, we started getting involved with investing in the Hainsel Shale about four or five years ago. And unfortunately, for, I mean, we, we, we did a lot of good. We, we, we assembled a pretty good portfolio of, of interest. And then, of course, the gas prices went to the point where they stopped really developing the play after they captured their leases. So everybody understands that theory, what's going on out there. They're capturing their leases. Nobody's going to go drill eight or ten wells on a pad anytime soon, I don't think. Now, at some point, somebody's going to do it, okay? And we're going to see kind of how that works and how the wells may communicate with each other or not <coughs> and what kind of productions we can, we can gross up in some of these big-ass units, you know? Everybody's concerned about the 1,920-acre triple deckers and with only one well going one way and so far we only have one company that seems to be a significant player who hasn't shown an interest in drilling two wells at one time and we're hoping we're going to coach them through peer pressure if you will into, do, into, into solving that problem and acting like some other companies where they're drilling one up north and one south which is what we want because we don't want half the unit developed because that, that that's like anything it leads to recriminations and problems with people who are in the part that's getting developed, wondering why the people in the north half of the unit might be getting paid when there's no well there. Okay, everybody follow that? Okay, um, we also sort of provide mineral representation services depending on what people need. Um, this is our little war map in our, in our office. It's rapidly changing. We have little cellophane pieces of, of colored tabs over 
the, the representing the colors of the operators, okay, so you can see through. It's a it's an oil and gas development map that we've imped together with a similar map in Louisiana. The only difference between this map and the one out there is that is, is that we we've got our own culture on it, okay? Um, it takes a long time to keep up with these maps and to keep, especially with the last three months worth of, of units, which have been obviously, you know, pandemic. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of my camera of our war map on our wall. We can't really move that. As you can see, things are oriented kind of differently down in Louisiana because they're, they, they consider this, the on-strike aspects to be sort of a southwest, northeast delineation. Um, we also maintain our maps on what's called a Tobin map. Tobin maps are traditionally old landowner maps. They're good for kind of figuring out where those tricky descriptions are, where something meanders along a creek or goes to a post or something like that. Frequently, you can pick out a difficult description on your mineral lease or your mineral deed by going to the old Tobin map. That the Department of Transportation Development map or the, or the, uh, or the, or that, the, the map I was just on, it's not going to allow you to do that. This is an area around a bit. It's kind of the easiest area because it's not a whole lot of utilization going on. This is a constant battle to keep these maps up too. The girls in the back are constantly trying to get everything up to speed. We also have, we, we keep the maps up on the, the and they don't call them tar, Department of Transportation Buildings. What do they call them? Department of Transportation Maps. I mean, it's a distinction without a difference. They're different from Mississippi. Mississippi's tend to be a little better than Louisiana because they're a little better quality now. Um, and I'm going to move fast through these slots because I've got a lot of them to get through. And if anybody wants to put the brakes on me, just, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll answer everybody's questions. And I'll just try to forge through and get to where I can get. These are the links I talked about earlier. Those are going to be on our website. And sooner or later, they're going to be on Burnell and Tommy's TMS Horizon website along with all these slides. So I think, speaking for Burnell, you're, you're going to be able to get a lot of these presentations, and including some way of getting these webcasts able to be downloaded off of the off of the TMS Horizons website. Um, this is another site you can go to, Amelia Resources. Kirk Burrell keeps a blog up, uh, and you go to Tuscaloosa Trend, and you can follow. It, it's nowhere near as comprehensive and as stream of consciousness as what's going on on the Facebook page for TMS, which is a real value to us all. And, and there's I think actually the, the posts have slowed down since Burnell and Tommy have really kicked it into higher gear on going to daily reports and all that stuff. So I put my pants on the same way. I hope all y'all do is just to go to the TMS Facebook page, which launches you over into the Horizons website for detail. They've done a very interesting, effective job of kind of migrating our attentions over to the website. So I'm sure everybody has made the trip on that. But this is a good source. You know, it's got some. Kirk is a technical guy. If you want to see some more technical stuff, then that's where you go. This is this is Louisiana's Department of uh, Natural Resources Sunrise or Sunrise site. It's easier just to say Sunrise. Um, and essentially, what you want to go here, things are basically broken into two categories. One is if you want to look at three, really. If you want to look at images, like documents, you go to one place. If you want to look at data, like look up reports and stuff, you go to another place. If you want to go look at maps, you go to a third place called GIS. Most of them are available. Um, Janelle's saying that the GIS images are best viewed in Chrome. Okay, that's a Google browser. I mean, everybody knows what that is. Um, she's saying that because it doesn't work as well in Internet Explorer or something, I would imagine. Okay, here you click on data access, and that's going to get you in to where you run your basic reports. In Louisiana, the emphasis is very much on a GIS interface, which means you, you figure out where you are in life. Yeah, so you go to your your uh, you go to your mineral deed or your lease or your tax bill and find out the sector township and range you're in, and then you can look up information <coughs> by section township and range, and it'll give you all wells that have a surface location in that section. And I'm emphasizing that because it's not the way. I would offer the way to do it. What counts in life is where your bottom hole is, because a lot of the wells have surface locations in place, even vertical wells. But who gets the money? It's where the bottom hole location is. Okay, less so in a shale play, because it's really from the point where your first perf perforation point is to your last perforation point. Frequently, that's pretty close to the surface too. So, 
in, uh, in a shale play, the surface of the bottom hole may be, may be both productive. Um, section catastrophe and range. Here, you know, there, there are more sophisticated reports you can do, but if you stick with the light reports, you'll get what you want, and it's fairly easy to do. So you click on light right here, okay? And here's what we're saying where you can find your STR, we call it. And this is 33 of Township 1 South. Townships, you don't have to put that in. They assume that. Townships and ranges are assumed. But you've got to put in whether it's one or two digits, and you've got to put the, the, the delineation north, south, or east and west. This is the Blades Well, which is over in North Tanchapoe, one of Goodrich's recently good wells, probably one of the top five in the industry right now. And I'm about to hit the query, but I, it's not live, so I don't have to. Um, here's where all the wells that are in the surface, that surface have surface locations in section 33 show up. In this case, the only well that has a surface location in 33 is the Blades. This is its serial number. That's the unique identifier for the well for, for wells in Louisiana. And you basically just click on that blue hyperlink. The status is over here. This stuff is not, you know, not uh, hyperlinks. And then it gives you basically what we call a well report. A well report's going to have everything you want to know about the well, okay? And the most important things are, you can see who the operator is. Unfortunately, they give you a code, so you have to click on the box. After a while, you get familiar with what codes or what companies. It's pretty straightforward. They give you the well name, including the unit, which is important. And then you'll see down here that there's a running uh, status of the history of the well and all its operations as reported to the Department of Natural Resources. You see the well was completed on, what, April 1st of 2014 as a well in the Tuscaloosa Green Shale Reservoir A, San Unit A, produced 1,250 barrels all a day, shut in tubing pressure. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of acronyms in our business and all that sort of stuff. Most of them, after a while, you can wade through them and figure them out. They're not too, too cryptic. This is where the well's perforated, and this is showing you that the well, in fact, exists and was completed as an oil and gas produ oil producer. Um, here you'll see that there's a loop code. In Louisiana, all unit production is lumped back to what's called a loop code. Loop code is an acronym for lease, unit, or well, because things can produce on a lease basis, like the SLC81 for now, which doesn't have a unit. For some reason, that's a lease, that's a lease producing well right now. I don't know. There's got to be more than one landowner involved in it, but so far, I don't know where there is. It's just one landowner. Yeah, usually there. So that's why they don't even need to make a unit. If you, don't have, if you only have one person who has to share, there's no sharing going on. They're getting all the oil from the well. Okay. Um, then you have a production history, which is right in here. And you'll see that there's, there's only about four months for the blades, but it's, it's it's doing pretty well. It's you know it's coming down like everybody else's wells that, that produce in this area. And this will give you the work description. It'll tell you the most recent time where they've actually fracture stimulated the, the well or perforated the well. In a lot of vertical wells, they'll come up the hole and they'll show you different perforations where they're going to produce dirt, different parts of the of the of the well's production up the hole. Um, Another thing that's really useful for finding out what's going on in Louisiana is this, 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 what we call the scout detail. Scout detail comes under well reports again. We're going to go look at the Lafayette one because the Lafayette one, there are three scouting areas in Louisiana. One is Lafayette, one is Shreveport, and one is Monroe. Lafayette's the one that handles the whole southern, southern part of the state. So you go to the Lafayette report. Um, a, lot, a lot of activity down in Louisiana, so it doesn't take a whole lot of time to find out what wells are drilling. Here's the Lafayette's, and you go for the PDF right over here, and this is a little snippet of the page of the scouting report that might be this big. It goes by parish, then by field, and then by well, okay? So once you orient yourself to the report, you can figure out what you can find. It shows that there, there are two wells working in Tangipola right now, which we all know, the Verburn, I don't know if I've got the pronunciation right, but it's close enough, and then Williams. And these, these statuses are all going to be a little bit late. That's not what it was doing yesterday, but it was doing what was reported the last time they, the company deigned to report to the, to the uh, Department of Conservation on what was going on, okay? Um, on to Mississippi. This is the main page for the, the Mississippi State Oil and Gas Board page. This, this banner up here has got uh, interesting stuff in it. The ones, I can't go over all these sites with you guys today, but I'm going to show you 
to kind of orient you and what I think might be useful to you. One is the hearings. The other is the rule book, which is, if, if you had to have two or three things to, to, to have in your life, if you want to kind of, you know, not self-lawyer, but you'll learn more about how this stuff works, it's this book right here. Louisiana has its own mineral code. They've been doing this stuff long enough that they took all the law and codified it into a book that has updates and stuff like that. I urge you to get that. This is the rule book for the Mississippi State Oil and Gas Board. You can get it off of this link right here, okay? Um, in it, it's got all kinds of stuff. I'm still reading it. To, to folks who are pretty well versed in this business, this stuff is still complicated, okay? The force pooling issues that are going on right now have, have kind of occurred over time, and they're getting, thanks to a lot of attention being brought, by the people who put on this seminar, in part, uh, they're being revisited right now. Some of the things that have been rubber stamped in the past that we know don't pass kosher tests are being fixed, and they're gonna be fixed. And they're gonna be fixed because of groups like, like what we have going here, you know, where people are uniting and voicing what their concerns are in a concerted manner together. Um, all right, let's see where we go from here. Um, this is the hearing docket. Brunel corrected me the other day because I thought the hearing was up for September, but it's just the proposed hearing. It's not finalized until some time afterwards. So here's where you can get the hearings, okay? And these, you need to look at them every, every time they come out because they're unitizing left and right, and your acreage may show up under a unit. You want to keep up with the current maps of the area and watch this hearing docket to see whether your sections are implicated in any of these proposed units, okay? Um, and I see no reason to expect they're not going to be a mess more next month. So um, I urge you, I commend that to you. Um, here's an example of the hearing docket. Has anybody seen this stuff? <coughs> Are all you guys from Louisiana or Mississippi or what? Who's from Louisiana? Raise your hands. Okay. About a third, maybe. In Mississippi, the rest. And then some people go both ways, right? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a good problem then. Okay. Uh, these are the hearing dockets. And then, you know, if you want to look at the rule book, you can download it in, what, in the Adobe PDF and print it all off and go to the infamous 5337, which is the force pooling rules, which are still being kind of debunked. And, and whether the lease or not, whether it's important to get a lease done before certain periods of time and all that, you'll learn more about that then. There, okay. Um, let's see. This is the first page of the rule book. I'll just give you an example. It's about that big. It has a table of contents and stuff so you can kind of navigate. Um, here, we're going to go in and do some basic queries on the Mississippi State Oil and Gas Board site. The site's not as user-friendly as the Louisiana version of it. But yet, there's a whole lot more action going on in Mississippi, so you need to really know how to use the Mississippi one if you want to mine data. Um, from what I'm told by my experts in my office, the, the, the mapping portion is tough, okay? It's just a tough, not user-friendly, you can master it, but it's like ARC info, and you're gonna, it's a learning curve. Um, it's, what we've shown here is the ability to uh, look up Um, look up either wells, and this is an example right here where we're looking up the Crosby well. We're going to use the Crosby as kind of a test case because it's our it's our it's our hero well. We're hoping all wells do as well as the Crosby well because then you're going to have payout in 16 months or whatever it took to pay that well out. 160,000 barrels in 16 months is pretty good lick, and it'll take care of paying out a well usually. Um, here you, you, you click on find after you've entered the word Crosby in here. It'll give you a list of different Crosbys that are wells all over Louis, uh, Mississippi. And you have to pick the right one. The 12-1, I guess, is what it is right here. And then there are various things that you can look at about that well. And they range from the location of the well, to documents associated with the well, to effective dates in the drilling process of the well, to the production of the well, all those things that are circled right in here. You can go, once you've got your well pinpointed, 
you can get all that information, okay? Um, this is an example right here of the location of the well, okay? You'll get the lat long, you can tell, I don't know if it gives you the, yeah, it gives you the distance off the corners. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. It may give you just a lat long. Um, it doesn't look like the north-south feet and the east-west feet are popular. So that's not gonna help you there, but if you wanna know the, um, here. These are the images associated with the well. These are going to be all of the different permits to drill, you know, the completion reports. No? No, this is well logs. Oh, this is the well logs. Okay, we're not quite to that. These are well logs. That's why they look so cryptic, okay? And an example of a well log is when you click on one, that's what you're going to get. It takes a while to load, and you can go look at the pay zone of the well where they completed it, how thick the, you hear people talking about how thick the structure is. You know, it's different in different places. You may have heard that. This is where if you had a geologist on staff, you could do this. This is not going to be particularly useful for laymen like, 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 like we. Um, now we're into the, uh, the, the documents. And that's where you get to see a lot more stuff that we're kind of interested in knowing. We're interested in knowing, you know, when it was permitted and, and um, how the permit looks. And then the completion report showing us how they completed the well. The, the method by which they're going to they're, they're going to transport oil and gas off the site, uh, the plat, which is also always useful for orientation purposes, and the spud report. So um, there's a permit to drill. You see the key areas are up in here, um, telling you the total depth that they're going to drill to, and various and sundry other things. Um, this is the completion report that down at the bottom has got the information on the on the completion. You know. Critical things there are, you know, pressures, the amount of barrels, the amount of gas, the total barrel equivalent, that sort of stuff, okay? Um, that's the, the certificate for compliance. They have to get an okay to move product off the site. And these are the important dates where things have happened. They're not very helpful in, in and of themselves, but if you click on them, you'll get more information, I imagine, as to what, what exactly is going on, you know, these completion reports, the field dates. It's kind of a status change date as you go along. Um, all this stuff can be cut and pasted into like Excel or Word and manipulated further. That's an example of that. And that's production. So it's probably the Crosby, but here's the production amounts right here. And this is where, if you want to do a search for, say, in Canada's wells, you can search by operator up here. Once again, this stuff is a little bit, it takes a little bit of a learning curve to get at it, but once you do that, you'll see the Anderson well show up down here that you can click on and in mine down to more information, and um, you'll see all of them can as well laid out. If you go to this this uh, button right here, you're able to search by section township and range. It's not the easiest thing in the world to fill this sucker in either. Uh, not like Louisiana, he was to say, but you can actually fill in the different parameters here, and then search, and you'll get you'll get a uh, some output. It's a lot easier to do this. I just wasted a little bit of time telling you the tough way to do things. This is the page the Mississippi Oil and Gas Board is dedicated to the Tuscaloosa Marine Channel. And it looks pretty ordinary when you look at it, but there's a lot of information here. All of these links are on the TMS Horizons website. But the critical thing here is this one right here, which shows basically every decent well that's been drilled in the recent past with production histories and curves of, uh, you know, graphs showing the production and information on, on the production date uh, month to month and how it's changed. You also have maps of Wilkinson County and Amit County, and those are the places where you'll probably get a pretty good up-to-date rendition of the unit delineations, okay? They're, they don't have landowner maps, it's not the Department of Transportation Development, but at least it shows you that there might be a unit in your section. Um, this is the Crosby information for that spreadsheet, that, that time versus production button I just showed you. And it kind of shows you the change in productions over time. Of course, they're all mostly red numbers because they're declining. Okay. 
Um, but I want to say this. See, see these wells down here? These are all different wells you can select. Okay? And you, look at, you can look at them by operator, but you have to kind of know the name of the well and the operator. You have to kind of know the operator or recognize the well off of Brunel's Friday report or something like that. Now, Brunel's Friday report is pre-production. So once it goes to production, it's not going to be there anymore. You've got to go look on here because it's kind of like, like the blades wouldn't show up on here. The blades is post-production. Okay. All right. Uh, here's an example of the Mississippi State Oil Gas Board's current Wilkinson County map. And it's not the greatest thing in the world, but you can see the sections. You can see whether your land is implicated or not. And, it, and they're keeping this thing up fairly, fairly often to the extent that they have now put in the Pike County units because we've got units over by Osaka, okay? Right down here. Residivity line kind of runs right through here, right through here like that, you know? I live right over here. I'm outside. Not necessarily a good thing, but I don't even know if I have my minerals or not, so it's one of those things. Um, here's the Amit County map. Here's the Gohanesville page. Gohanesville is a, is anybody familiar with Gohanesville a little bit? No, huh? Well, that's, that's another blog that was formed years ago when the Hainesville came into its own. And since then, there are folks who are active within that site who formed a TMS portion of that site. And uh, to be honest, I don't learn a whole lot on this site that I don't learn first on the TMS Horizons website. But you can occasionally go here, and you know anybody can come up with a really good piece of information at any time and put it anywhere on one of these sites. So I, I keep it in my arsenal of things that I check every so often to keep up with what's going on. But I'm only putting it in there from the standpoint of, of inclusion. Um, then you go to the companies that are involved with this stuff. They put a lot of good information out on their websites and on their investor presentations. You just have to go mine it. But they'll, Goodrich, if you're trying to sell your minerals or do anything, it, it, one of the best things you can do is go print off that Goodrich presentation and hand that to anybody who wants to buy your minerals with you because that, that'll educate them about 90% of what's going on in this play from a technical standpoint and from a, a practical standpoint. This is an example of their current structure map with some of the current wells on it. You can see these lines right here are different depths. The, the, the play is primarily between 11,000 and 14,000 feet TVD, true vertical depth. And that brings it down into this part of, of uh, Louisiana and, and primarily the fairways right through here with, with in, in Mississippi. And these are some of the wells that are out there. This is a, a, a this is a great slide because it kind of tells you where the leaseholds <coughs> are going on, where where people have leased stuff in bulk. Now it's not perfect. It's not to say that in this big blob of G, of Goodrich acreage here, there's not some Sanchez and some Halcon and some other leases in there. But it means that primarily that's that's who's got that territory. The majority of it. We all know it. Canada's got the southeast corner of a bit, but we didn't maybe know that it's got, you know, a good part of a bit. And that Goodrich has the part that's up near the the Bates and the Nunnery and the Huff Well, if you're all familiar with that as all. Well. You know, stuff that's just east and southeast of Liberty and northeast of Liberty and east of Liberty. Okay. You guys don't have any questions so far, huh? Am I going too fast? All right. This is Goodrich's main well page. Now, the only thing Goodrich doesn't do, sometimes they don't put other people's wells on their page, but in this case, I think they've got most of them. So this is in their presentation, okay? And once again, that stuff's on here. So if you go to these links, and you have about a, used to be a two martini uh, session on the computer, now it's about uh, three, three <laughs> bottles of gin. Uh, you, can, you, can get, you can get through this stuff if you stay after it, okay? Uh, a lot of what we learn is that when you get on top of stuff, you can kind of keep up with it, especially if you're only looking at your area. You know, I'm, I'm charged with kind of keeping up with all of it, so it's a little bit more of a learning curve for me. This is the Crosby well. This is the flagship. But we've got some other wells down here that are on the come. That little one right there is the, is a, is the C.H. Lewis well that, that uh, there are current arguments going on as to whether it's the best well or the... The Lewis 815, or is, it, is that right? 718. 718, thank you. 
uh, or the, the new Pintar number two or whatever is gonna, gonna take over the current record. The current record for production in a month in the TMS is about 27,000 barrels and some change. The Crosby didn't get it because it did it in the month of February, okay? So in effect, it got cheated out of three days, so it's probably the true winner pound for pound. But the C.H. Lewis is right there, and, uh, and I'm sure the, the other Lewis well is, and the Pintar will be right up there. What we're all trying to figure out is whether the more fracking they do in the bigger stages, is that going to turn into more initial production, more production down the road, or how's that all going to work? And we're all seekers here. We're all just, we're all waiting with bated breath for every month of production that comes out, because I don't know whether you all know it, there's a couple of companies that, that are very good about sharing information. There's one company that doesn't like to share much at all just because they're not suited to doing it. And so you really have to wait on, on the Mississippi State on Gas Board to tell you what's going on within Canis Wells. Halcon and Goodrich, they're out there tooting their own horns trying to get the stock price solidified. For some reason, they're all tanking these days. I have no idea why. I still think their stocks are good bets in this. As they're going down, I, you know, I'm not saying go buy their stocks, but I wouldn't say it's a bad, it's a bad deal, you know. So, anyway, that's cumulative production. That tells the scorecard. This is a slide that's supposed to be the prototypical well in in, a, in our area, and it's, it's they're basing everything on somehow these wells are going to produce 600,000 barrels over their lives. Now, I've talked to a bunch of geologists who do their work for them, and I ask them, is it baked yet? Can we really bank on this? And, he, and, and Lewis Gilbert and others, they shake their heads and say, it's too early, Ben. You know, it's just too early. So, but they have ways of knowing from these hyper, hyperbolic curves what a well is going to do over time, okay? And that's the middle of the road case. It used to be that Goodrich had a 400,000 EUR curve. I don't see that anymore. I think we've eliminated the low end, which is a good sign. But where do we want to be? We want to be here, or we want to be at this next slide, which is the 800,000 barrels. And it's telling to see which wells Goodrich put in this slide. Okay? You see the Crosby's there. The Encana wells are there. The CMR 8-5, which is really a, kind of an older well now, maybe six, seven months old. But the Lewis is there, and the Blaze is there. And this is where, when I said they don't include some other people's wells sometimes, okay? So you got to take that with a grain of salt. Here's some other slides. I'm just going to kind of breeze through these. This is the conclusions that, that, that Goodrich has, has taken from this. In the last four months, they've kind of cracked the code on at least two or three things. One is they, they had trouble making the turn on the angle of the drilling because they went through this, this rubbleized zone, so to speak, where the casing integrity became an issue. So they've steepened the angle of that and apparently aren't having any more problems with that. They've also gone to exclusively um, drilling out composite plugs, and, and they've, they've tweaked their, their frac fluid propent uh, formula significantly enough so that they're getting some standardized. Uh, and I don't know what a zipper frac is. Does anybody know what a zipper frac is? Brunel, what's a zipper frac? They prepare a stage over here for fracking while they're fracking over here. And then they swap. They crack over here while they're preparing over here. So they're, they're multitasking kind of. So, well, you see, when you do one at a time, you have half of you folks doing nothing, twirling their thumbs. Right. You do two at a time, everybody's working. I'm working over here, preparing, and they're fracking here, then you switch. Now I'm fracking I'm, and I'm preparing. And they go back and forth and back and forth. It sounds like it's a zipper. Yeah, it sounds similar to the way they're drilling, like the Sabine and the Ashwells now, which is where they're kind of. They're working both wells at one time, and I've never seen that done, but apparently it's working for them. And those wells are coming to total depth here pretty soon, so if not already in fracking. Um, in Canada, you know, there's not a whole lot here, but I always look at their presentations anyway. It's just a couple of slides. And this is showing that drill set to net 10 gross. Don't quite know what that means either. That means they're in wells with other people, you know, so that their share of wells with other people by the time if you you figured out if they had 100% of them, they'd have six of them. That's the way I look at that. I don't quite know whether that's correct or not. Two rigs running there. Goodrich has three. Two rigs running. This is in Canis, kind of leasehold position. Um, this is kind of their, their commitment. This is what their well costs. Everybody's trying to get down to $10 million a well. You know, it's going to take a while. 
Uh, they're not there yet. Um, and certainly when they, when they do drill out the pads, it's going to improve. You know, when they drill out their units, they'll get a per well cost that's down in the reasonable areas. Uh, this is Halcon, another major player. Have to come over from the Eagleford. They, they give good slides too. In fact, even better ones in Goodrich in some places. This is their activity map with their lease holes. This is the one that, uh, uh, that shows kind of the outline of the play. This is called the resistivity line, outside of which the, 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 uh, the, the, the success of a TMS well is going to be more questionable. That mean that in, in the Haynesville, we'd, it was first this big, and then now there are people drilling down here, and there are people drilling up here. So those lines can become arbitrary at some point, and we may see discoveries outside. I mean, the nunnery is right on the edge of it. It produced. So some of these wells are still commercial, and they're not going to be inside that red line. But right now, people are staying inside the lines, just like kids with color books. Uh, this is the oil in place, the one that, uh, that gets shown a lot. And of course, it's on top of where Alcon thinks the, the mother hole is. There's also a nice little bubble over here in Tangipahoa Parish where there's a lot of activity right now, right around the blades well. Okay. That's Halcon's summary of, of what, what they're doing well and why they believe in the play. Everybody's speeding up the days that they're drilling it in, which is saving money and doing other things. Okay, Comstock, very little. We've seen uh, one well and one, I guess one rig run at Humber now. One, yeah, I really like that map. The, the, the gray is where the oil is and the green is where the gas is, the way it was explained to me. I like that. The, the, I didn't realize that when I saw it. So yeah, I, I, that I, I'm with you. I thought the gray was just background. I didn't realize that's, so they've got oil up in here too. They would say that the oil play with the gray part of it and the green part would be more of a gas part. Yeah, where you get to the deeper depths, mm -hmm. you know, where you get the gas. Um, this is a little bit showing what's going on. Comstock is drilling wells right up here right now. They're on one, and, and from this slide, it looks like they're going over to the one next to it. And then, of course, they've got this one right down here in Louisiana. Uh, I think it's the Meeks well. They're going to drill probably pretty soon, too. So that's what, that's the scoop bar in Canada. Sanchez is kind of a one-horse town, a one-well town. And that's the Dry Fork East, which we're been kind of a well from hell that's taken a while to get on. But uh, apparently that's going to be, I guess they're going to announce those results fairly soon because it's flowing back. OK. Um, here we are on the Facebook page. Everybody knows they wouldn't be here if they weren't going to this. So not a lot to say there. This is the. Uh, Got Chad's picture there twice. Um, this is the, the website that, that uh, has, has been unveiled recently. That's a fully diversified website on everything you want to know about the marine shale, including, you know, Brunel's news articles and education, including the stuff here. All the, all the, all the slideshows from today will be up here under this education eventually. There's a minerals page, which we're going to be helping unveil, which is going to show all the listings that people are looking to, to uh, to, to, to get minerals sold or royalties sold. We work them up in our office down in New Orleans and, and provide them out there on that, on that site. That's still got some tweaking going on because people are going to have to register for that. Since we're kind of doing that as a business, we're going to have listings with the parties that want to do stuff, and we're running it like a business. So it's going to take a little while. We have to qualify the buyers and qualify the sellers. It's not a real big deal, but we got to know who we're doing business with. Okay, um, And that's coming. Um, this is a little example of the minerals page, and you'll get, you'll have some things you can launch off from here to look at, look at, look at pictures. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into this today, but this is, this is turning your attention to 5337. If you're worried about you haven't been leased, you need to read this, and you need to talk to somebody who's qualified to advise you on the importance of getting leased versus not leased, some of the time frames involved. And it's a dynamic situation right now, so you need to pay attention to that if you're not leased. I, I could just say this, and I don't mean to be an alarmist, but there's a scenario that I, I haven't seen happen yet, but there's a conceivably a scenario that, and I could be corrected by a Mississippi lawyer who actually practices in Mississippi, but from what I've read it, you could be unleased in, in Mississippi and have alternate 
risk charges assessed against you as an unleased party. And it, not, it wouldn't be a good thing. Because at least if you were leased to, uh, for, I'm not going to say it's Dewey Cheatham and Howe oil company, but somebody who maybe is not going to follow through with the ultimate drilling of the well and, and their investors, as you heard earlier today, over that other side, if you, if you lease with them, you at least get the 3 sixteenths, you know, safety net that the state oil and gas board gives you in the event your lessee chooses not to participate and is charged these alternate risk fees. But that, that remedy's not there for if you don't lease, okay? So it's kind of an incongruous thing, and we're looking at it very closely. So you mean to have you on a lease as opposed to just don't do anything to see what happens? Well, I th th there's some things that we do for that, that recommendations that can be made. I don't want to flippantly give them out, but there, there are ways, I think, that including leasing to a subsidiary LLC that you own 100%, so that at the very end, at the very least, you've got an entity that you own and control where you'll end up with the 316s if everything goes south on everything else. So there's some, there's some safety measures that can be put into place, I think, for some of this stuff. Um, but you need to go see a qualified landman or a lawyer who's you know, licensed to know how, to, how this stuff works and who, who's willing to go up here in front of the state on the gas board. A lot of these guys are, are humans, and if you, if, they, if the oil companies go in there and they and they say that they've circulated all these affidavits and they're true and correct and all that, and I'm hearing more and more stories about people saying, I never heard anything from anybody, and they're forced pulling me, and I want a lease. And we heard the lady in there in the first talk on the Mississippi legal considerations. It occupied a fair amount of the time of that talk to, to discuss with her what was going on. Um, you know, you just need to be... In Louisiana, we don't have that problem. We've got, we've got what's called the Louisiana Risk Fee Statute. It's 30 colon 10. And if you're an unleased mineral interest owner in Louisiana, all they can do is take out your share of, of, of the drilling costs and the completing costs. And then you get your net after that. You know? When I say net, it's after you've paid your share of LOE, lease operating expense. But you get 100% of your share of the production. No ifs, ands, and buts, none of these other swords of Damocles coming down and <laughs> making you like never see anything and stuff or whatever. Um, so Louisiana is a little bit of a simpler regime in which to work when it comes to that stuff. I can tell you that much. Um, and I'm just going to breeze through these because I think I just dis discussed a lot of them. Force pooling, I mean, we could have a whole talk for an hour on that and it would be really revealing, but we, we don't have time for it without dedicating a talk just to that. And that may be well, well a reason to have another one of these things at some point in the future and dedicate it to getting some of the forest pooling pros in here to discuss it. Um, this is the stuff. You know, when you go to these that website and you get this stuff, at least all the all the law is here for you. You don't have to go find it in this book, although it's all in the book. We've actually captured it on these slides. And that's the one where you get three sixteenths if you're, you know, if you're uh, leased and your lessee chooses not to participate. Okay, this is Louisiana's law, and this is thirty colon ten, and it says, you know, agreements for drilling units, pooling interests. It's our version in Louisiana of forced pooling in Mississippi. Okay, and essentially it's. It's the same sort of thing. They've got to send you notice that they're going to drill the well, tell you everything about it, the objective, the cost, you know, embodied in the AFE, and, and ask you whether you're going to, you know, proverbially blank or get off the pot. Are you going to participate, or are you going to, you know, frequently they'll come to you and, and lease you, try to lease you, or try to farm you out. But there's basically two different things you can do in Louisiana. You either don't participate, which subjects you to a penalty, and that's if you have a lease now. That's the lessee. And one thing that's changed in Louisiana, which is really good, which created a real, which was a real problem before, is I'm a landowner. I would lease to a company, and then the company would go non-consent on the well because it didn't believe in the well and, and maybe thought it was too expensive, didn't believe in the geological idea. And the duty historically is if I lease to a lessee, the lessee pays me the royalty. And if you're out 300%, that's your problem. You've got to pay out of pocket to me because I made my contract with you. I didn't make my contract with the operator, okay? Now, they've changed that in Louisiana, effective August 1st, 2012. 
to where the operator now has to give the lessee the royalty money. Now, getting it from the lessee is, may still be a wrestling match, but the operator washes his hands, gives the lessee the money that it has for its royalty, and that it's incumbent upon the lessee to pay its royalty owners with that money. Everybody follow that? Okay. That's got, there's some can of worms in that that they didn't think about where you can do some mischief there, and I keep telling them, but they, they, they kind of hadn't happened yet. But I won't go there. But at least they've started to address that issue. Because in many situations, people were going to their lessee, and the lessee's like, I'm on 300% penalty. You expect me to pay your royalty. Go get it from the operator. And that wasn't the way it worked. Okay? And it took an appellate decision to fix that and get a legislative solution. Apparently, you know, a lot of times you get these appellate decisions when something actually doesn't get settled and it goes to appeals court. And then out of that, we get truth and light because the government, the legislature, then it goes, solves the problem legislatively, okay? All right. Um, I'm going to breeze through all this because all of it's just language from 3010. All right, we're into monetizing minerals, okay? You guys have a little broad brush of how to deal with online resources. Um, all right. Obviously, you've heard before there's differences in Mississippi and Louisiana. Primarily, it's with this prescription issue. You know, what people haven't said though is that you can have the effects of prescription in Louisiana. You give somebody a 10-year mineral deed. Okay, it can happen. But if you don't dedicate a certain period of time to a mineral reservation or a royalty reservation, it's forever. <coughs> but nowadays, lawyers can cook up all sorts of hybrid stuff. Okay, and you're free to continue track with anybody as long as you're not in derogation of the law, okay? Or bonus mores, which is like good morals. It's really kind of aspirational. Um, so here's where, you know, you've got these, these issues with forced cooling and liberative prescription. You know, um, we used to have delay rentals in Louisiana. Louisiana did things differently from Mississippi. Mississippi used to be, you bought your lease, um, <coughs> You bought your lease, you paid a bonus, you had a dollar an acre rental. Does anybody remember any of that? Dollar an acre, they pay it up usually, but they paid you the dollar an acre. So everybody would say, oh, I got $250 an acre, I have 10 acres, where's my extra $10 per year? And you get the $10, but now they've done away with all that because it's a distinction without a difference. So we don't have rentals anymore. In South Louisiana, if I lease to somebody and they pay me $200 an acre, I get it every year. You want the lease for two years, you pay the $200 again, okay? Of course, that's South Louisiana. That's stacked reservoirs, nothing square down there. The units are all amorphous on top of each other, you know, if you envision what I'm saying. Okay, so, um, all right. Uh, primary terms, you know, they can differ. Obviously, pew clauses, does everybody understand <laughs> roughly what a pew clause is from listening to the other talks? That's where they don't let you keep the acreage outside the unit forever and ever. Used to be if you had a lease, and it happened. It happened in these counties. Companies would lease 50 acres over here in this township, 100 acres over here in this township, all over the place. One well on one of those held all of them, okay? And, and that's not a good thing. That's not the result we want. We want oil and gas companies to drill it or drop it or release it. Okay, so... In effect, that's what units do. Units make it so that they make it effective as if the well were on every tract in the unit. That's what the beauty of a unit is. That's why these guys are all doing this unitization so crazy. Because if you go to drill a well and you don't have a unit and your leases start expiring in the north half of what would be the unit if you had it made, you're going to lose your leases, okay? Everybody understand that? You only get to keep what you drilled on, okay? All right. Um, Surface restrictions, you know, up here, I don't see much of that. I would, and I know a lot of people don't have another bite at the apple on their leases, but if you haven't leased, it's probably a good idea to not just, to put in a clause that says, you're not allowed to use the surface without my prior written consent. Now, they'll make you put some weasel language in, which consent shall not be unreasonably withheld, but at least you got a, you got a, you got a ability to negotiate from that point. So. If they want to put the well where you don't want it, they don't put the well where you don't want it, okay? And that's what I do in the leases I, I help people grant. I want, 
The other thing is that technically, that's another opportunity to monetize your minerals because if they come and drill on your property, they're taking your property out of commerce. And that seven acres is gonna be gone, gone forever, okay? Especially when they come in and put all the other Christmas trees on it and drill it all out. That, you know, you're never gonna get it back. So you need to figure out what that land's worth and what the, you know, either monetizing it as its total value and what's land going around here for? 3,000 an acre, roughly? Roughly, you know? 3,000 an acre, that sounds like a good number to me. 21 grand, you want my seven acres, okay? All right. Um, all right, where were we? Uh, I don't remember term extensions, P clause, lease operations, unit operations, surface restrictions, severed versus non-severed. You know, all that's all that we talked about a little bit. All right, in selling your minerals, what what dictates what kind of offer you're going to get? Well, this is fancy engineering talk right here. PDP and PUD versus potential or possible. That's what people who do economics reserves of your oil and gas holdings, companies get this done all the time, reserve reports. That's how they classify what you have. PDP is the good stuff. That's prove, develop, produce. Okay? That's what we're all here after. If you believe in the hereafter, that's what we're here after. PUDs are proved undeveloped locations. That would be your density wells. Okay? But they're not proved yet because they're not there. Okay? Potential impossible, that's like, that, that's wishing on a star. Okay? They discount the hell out of that stuff when they give you value. All right? Um, how am I doing for time? Anybody know? Short. Huh? 150. You're short. Sure. 150, what does that mean? You have I mean, how much time do I have left? 20 minutes. Huh? 20 minutes. Okay, I'm rolling. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Y'all yeah. stop me if you need to. Uh, okay, so so whether you're in the fairway, whether you're in a leased or unleased situation, all those things are going to dictate what somebody is going to want to give you for your minerals or your royalty or your lease for that matter. Where are we? Where are we on that scale right now? P, 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 well, well, it's a little. The valuation is a little bit different because we're in a shale place, so everything could could arguably be PUDs because they're going to produce. You know, we're all the big sixty-four dollar question is: Is this play really truly commercial from a return on investment? You know, aspect for these companies. In other words. If they drill one or two of these things, do I like it enough where I'm going to want to drill eight more of them and come back and do it? That's where the rubber meets the road. Nobody's going to make a whole lot of money out of one or two wells in this stuff. And that's why the price of poker is not, not better than what it is, because the investors are in the same boat that you all are in. We don't know whether the density wells are going to come. In the Haynesville, they didn't come, unless you were under Exco's uh, units. That's a company up in North Louisiana or up Chesapeake's drilling out some of its past, but there's no rhyme or reason to it, okay? I, you know, I mean, some of those wells up in, in Haynesville are just straight up uneconomic, so I mean, it's it's a question, why are they drilling more of them, you know? I mean, it's like, uh, it's like the, it's a little bit of contrary reasoning there, but some people have gas, gas commitments they have to satisfy. There's a lot of other stuff behind the scenes that goes on with the machinations and decisions made by these oil and gas companies. Um, so selling your minerals is, 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 is dependent on, on a lot of this stuff. The likelihood that they're gonna they're gonna drill in the near future. You know, sometimes we know, thanks to Brunel and his incredible scouting machine, where the wells are gonna be next, okay? Where where the rigs are gonna go. And tracking the rigs, that's that's one of the most valuable things the service that the TMS Horizons group brings to the table, okay, is, is having that scuttlebutt about knowing where that well is going to go next. Because that could be to your property and could immediately translate you from maybe getting $500, $750 a mineral acre to getting $3,000, okay? Um, royalties the same, except that, you know, up here, people seem to sell their minerals more than their royalty, even, you know? And minerals, of course, as we saw in the last talk from the Louisiana guy, minerals are a a, a more robust body of, of, of real property right to sell. You're going to get more for your minerals than you're going to get for your raw. Okay? Because the minerals are, are, the minerals translate into more royalty. 
because of the 20%. A royalty acre is one eighth of an acre. 20% makes it a 1.6 factor. And I'm going to show you all the math here on that in a minute. Okay, let's move on. I'm going to show you the conversion. All right. This is one little thing I wanted to tell you about prescription. It's kind of a nuance, um, and I'm not even going to go into it because none of y'all are dealing with reserving your minerals in Louisiana. But there's a way to do it where if you reserve your minerals when you sell to somebody, that 10-year clock starts running, okay? And if somebody comes and drills on a unit that embraces just a little part of that, it's only going to river up that part of your tract, okay? The, the little part that the unit caught. But if you put this clause into your mineral reservation, it interrupts it for all of it, okay? So you want this clause in your mineral reservation. It's 31 colon 75. It's in the materials. And that's it. It's saying that an interrupted prescription resulting from unit operations shall extend to the entirety of the tract. That's a, not a lot of lawyers even use this, but it's starting to show up. Got to move on. Okay. Why do you sell your minerals? Well, it's, you know, I almost feel silly going through this slide because everybody has reasons for doing it. They're personal usually. But we've seen all types, you know. And, and uh, you know, they can be personal. They can be not so personal. But, um, you know, these are some of the reasons. I'm not even going to go through them. Um, you know, nowadays there's a lot, a lot of units out there. And down in Louisiana, if you form a unit in a well, pretty much sure it's going to get drilled. Up here, you know, it's got to the point where if you've got a unit on your property, you're really not that special anymore, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because there's so many of them, all right? Look at what Comstock did in one, in one deal, you know, going across the top of Wilkinson County. So everything is about the timing of the drilling, okay? Because people don't want to invest in stuff and wait two or three years to even begin to think about getting their money back. And these wells take a while to drill and get them online, okay? So, Wells have had mechanical issues. Well, are too far in the future. Those are reasons why uh, you might want to, you know, if you're if you're a little elderly and, you're, and you don't have a lot of kids that you want to leave a nest egg of this stuff to. There's a lot of argument to maybe cashing out. You get a favorable tax. I'm sure I haven't been to the tax shows, but they've obviously been telling you that you can take a long-term capital gain tax as opposed to income. You know, I have royalty. I pay thirty. I don't know what it is, 37% on every dime that comes in or something because of my income bracket. If I were to sell that stuff after holding it a year, I'd pay about 15% on my gain, 15 and some change, okay? Um, things to consider. This is just some tips on if you're going to think about selling your minerals or entertaining any thoughts of them, these are things you should think about. First of all, you need to know your stuff. You need to know your track. If you can't, get somebody to help you, you know, because that's important to buyers. They have to know what you have to give you their highest and best offer, okay? Um, and that's what this says right here. You know, if you're an undivided interest owner and you don't know what you own, you know, people will figure that out during the title phase before you get your money. But if you know what you own and you can, and you can demonstrate it, you'll get a check, okay? Like, you sign the deal, I'll give you a check. But most people are going to want some time to check your title, okay? And title here in Amid County is a breeze compared to Wilkinson County, okay? And that's just from my experiences. Wilkinson's gotten a little better, but it's still tough sledding in title. And just because you own your minerals doesn't mean you own the royalty under those minerals, okay? The royalties could have been severed off separately. I asked a question earlier today about that. Um, so you need to know your title. You need to evaluate your minerals. You can, there's a number of ways you can evaluate your minerals. You can do a lease check in your area. We, have, we do this for a business, so I've got a number of sources where I can go pull down leases in all the sections in your area. I can advise you on it. I'm happy to share. You ask me the right questions, I'm going to tell you the truth because I'm an officer of the court. I can't lie to you. Okay? So, I'll help you with that if you, if you need help from me. But you need to know whether your other landowners around you are leased as well. If they're not leased, that's not a good sign, okay? It's, it's, it's not a good sign. It means they may not have gotten to you yet. There's a lot of things going on. These people have a lot on their plates. 
and they're not able to get to everybody, everyone, every, you know, all at once. Should they have a general area where a mental right is worth X amount of dollars in a certain area? It, it's not. It, it's not that easy because there's so many factors involved. I'm gonna get to that. Okay. It's in other words, there's a range. Nobody likes to throw out numbers, but I'm gonna throw some numbers out at the end based on my personal experience over the last four or five months of being in this play and figuring out who's doing what, where, and where I'm comfortable. This is this is the Ben Waring attitude on things. This is not hedge fund Chicago funny money. Okay. This is like reality. Okay. It's great to get that stuff if you can get it, but I have a nephew who's, uh, I'm doing good. I, I have a nephew who's hot and tried all this stuff and works it all. He comes in and says, man, I hear they're paying X over here. Well, you know what? When I say, show me the money. And it's funny how they all disappear. The people paying 6000 an acre and all that. I hadn't seen one yet. Okay. Um, not to say, and I'm going to show you something here that, that, that will explain this a little bit more. There are people that pay that. They're just not in this jurisdiction. They're not down here at these meetings. Okay. Real quick, I've had this happen twice. Recently, the most recent, I received a check in the mail for $250. And in reading it, it was to buy my minerals on around 100 acres. <laughs> uh, now, if, if someone you know, said, oh, wow, check for $250 and cash that check, would that be binding? Would they have sold? No. Okay. No. That would be, thank you very much. I'll put it in my Halloween candy. <laughs> and, and that's, it's like getting a magazine subscription that you haven't asked for. You get to keep the magazine and thumb your nose at the publisher, okay? So that's, that's why. And I know I'm being cavalier about answering that. But as long as you don't sign your, your name, we, we send out mail outs. Our company does it. You know, we send out in areas where we're targeting. We send out, in some cases, what's called a tickler letter that says we're interested in buying your minerals. But when the push comes to shove, when you see a professional document that has a notary and has a draft or an offer for payment, order for payment, and it's got a place for your sign and, 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 and total instructions on how to execute it and suggestions that you go get competent help to do it and all that sort of stuff, that's more of the real thing. So you take it to a good landman or a good lawyer and, and if you're a motivated seller, that's an easy thing. They'll say these people are straight up or they're not. Okay? And if it smells like a fish, it's a fish. You know? And nobody's going to buy anything in this place for $250. Right. Well, so that's I, answered your I, question. I was concerned about relatives that may see, oh, wow, $250. Well, that's, that's, why, that's why my main competition in the back is telling people don't, don't deal with the worser parts of people like me. Okay? Because some of them are not straight up people. And they're there to steal your stuff. And people came through. Everybody kind of knows what's going on now, so it's a little bit more of a straight up, fair playing field. But eight months ago, I've been through all these records. Eight months, a year, two years ago, people came through and cleaned everybody out. I'm not gonna name any names, but because it's not, it's not a sin. It could have been a bargain for exchange, but people didn't really get a good deal, okay? Because people bought early. Now you buy early, you're taking risk. What's risk? Risk is lower price. Okay? As this thing gets more and more of a shine on it, the prices will get to a certain point and they're going to stay steady. And I'm going to show you why here in a minute. Uh, so you evaluate your offers. I put here all unsolicited mail offers are not all bad. Some could be competitive, but you don't need to make snap decisions. You don't need to be bullied into anything. Don't, nobody pays with checks. Okay? That's the first thing to make you smell foul. Okay? Nobody pays with checks because they don't know what you got. There. Nobody's going out there saying, I'm going to go work on the Brown track this afternoon and figure out everybody who's owned everything back from patent, and I'm going to concentrate on this track. Nobody be in business. Okay? I don't have the energy to do that because the Browns may never sell me anything, and I've wasted a week and a half. The amount of time that goes into this title work is prodigious. Okay? Um, like Burnell suggests on his site with Tom. Consider selling half of what you have and see, and you can see whether or not, nah, you know, I, I did pretty well on that. Maybe I'll sell the other half. Maybe I'll wait a little while, sell the other half for a little more. Okay. Um, it's enough of that. The importance of packaging your minerals. This is, I, I talked about this briefly, but you need to know this stuff. 
your tract acreage, your growth of that mineral acres, your location. This goes for the stuff that you send to Tommy, too. It helps us if you can tell me where your stuff is. Send a legal description in to Tommy if you want me to check it out for you or our group to run it up the flagpole and give you an evaluation. I'm going to just call you up and say, I can't do anything until you tell me where you are, okay? Right? Everybody understand that? Um, you know, if you've got recorded leases burgeoning in the track, then give us the, give us the leases. The memo ain't going to do me any good. It doesn't tell me the critical things I need to know, okay? Memoranda is a very small snippet of the oil and gas lease that they put in the courthouse records in lieu of the actual lease. We need to see the lease, okay? A lot of people don't keep their leases, so that's a problem. Then I got to get on the phone with a can with the other person on the phone saying, "Tell them to give, tell them to give me your lease, okay?" And that just is a lot of work. Um, then we can make it quicker. Stay in touch with the lease. Whoever leases you, keep their number. Find out who the lease analyst is at the company. Find out who the divisional analyst is at the company. Find out who the landman is. Don't bother the landman if you don't have to. It's going to be hard to get. But the lease analyst and the divisional analyst will help you every time. All right? And once you establish rapport with these people, as long as you've got reasonable questions to ask them when you call them, they're going to take care of you. That's their job. Is it the landman's job to lease as cheap as he can? Yeah, they're not there to represent you. They're not there to represent you. They're there to get a job done. So they're not your friends. They're, they're business partners. No. Okay, copies of division orders. You're getting paid. That tells us what you have. Your check stub. You can take out the name or the amount, but just I need to know the UDI. I'll show you what that is real quick. Unit, UDI is a unit decimal interest. That's what we need to know. Oh, real quickly. Um, now, well, I'll just talk about it. In Louisiana, you don't have to sign a division order. Okay? There's a statute in here that says, and I wouldn't sign it. I would not sign a division order in Louisiana. In Mississippi, I haven't heard yet whether you have to or not. We're getting paid on some stuff we didn't. But I'd be really careful before you sign a division order in Mississippi unless you absolutely know it's correct. Okay? If it ain't correct, don't sign it. Call up the lease analyst and say, I don't I didn't figure it the way you did. Can you help me? All right? Okay. This is a, an Encana division order. I've signed it, but I've told my office, don't you dare send it back until I okay you to send it back. Because it's got some problems and here's where they're trying to tell me how they calculated the interest. And it makes a little bit of sense, but I'm still confused by it. This happened the other day. This is like in my office right now, where I'm trying to figure out how they arrived at this number right here, okay? So you, you, either you understand it through the formulas I'm going to give you here in a second, or you don't. And if you don't, don't do it. This came along with it. This is a thing of beauty. You see this? Has everybody seen these? Everybody seen one of these? This is called a unit survey plat. It gives you the whole enchilada. This is the pintard. This is every tract that has a disparate mineral ownership on it in the unit with all the people right here. And their share in tract size of the total unit. So with this thing, you can do a lot of good, okay, once they give you this. That shows they survey the unit. It's going to give you the total unit acreage. You can do your formulas with that. Okay? If you don't know the total unit acreage, you're never going to be able to figure anything out. Because you can't tell how much of your share of the pie is coming from that unit. All right? How many times do you get one of these? You get this with your division order. I just got this, what, Janelle, two days ago? Two or three days ago. So they, they sent them out for each well. They, they drilled the second pin tar, so I don't so know what all it's all in this uh, site, is it? You know, I, they've got a file with the State Oil and Gas Board. I imagine they are there somewhere. They might be under those documents where you go to plat in Louisiana, they, they come up with unit survey plats. Same thing. But it's, it's a, this, this thing right here is about $200,000 worth of work. Right here. That's $200,000 worth of title work. Alright. Here is a check stub. Check stub. I've redacted but it really doesn't pay attention because it's mine. And it's in the nunnery and the C.H. Lewis. And you see what you get. They're doing it right. Goodrich does it right. They just do it right. They give you that gross value. Okay, that's total unitized substance. Five minutes. Five minutes? All right. I'm going to rob a little bit of the break from the next one. <laughs> 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 
That's the that's the record keeper right there. That's that twenty seven thousand barrels I told you. The C H Lewis. Here it is. It's value. What are we looking for here at support? What's that value? You say one hundred and six dollars a barrel. That's what we're here after. Oil's trading at ninety two now. We're getting one hundred and six. Y'all like that? I like. It. Okay, so that's that's what your check stub will look like. That's attached to the check. You don't want to lose these. These you want to put in a safe spot. They'll show you the deductions. Here, the only deduction in, in, in the Hainesville, Chesapeake tells me, well, you got a, you know, $10,000 on your check, but by the time the dust clears, it's 12 cents. After they take out all the stuff they take out because it's gas, and plus they're just not the greatest company in the world for being straight up honest with But here, we don't have all that mess. We've got... We don't have dehydration and compression and transportation and all this other stuff with you know, ION on the end. We have severance tax, which is small. See that? That's digestible. Okay. Let's move on. Um, Does any management fee or, or, or anything like that come out of that? No. Zip. Zip. That's the beauty of rule. And minerals, you know, that there's no cost of production. This is uh, this is the article earlier that I said is in Louisiana State Mineral Code that says you don't have to sign a royalty. And in fact, if they don't give you a uh, division order, if you if you don't if you don't sign the division order, they still don't pay you. You can spank them, okay, <laughs> with attorney's fees and with with uh, double damages and all that stuff. Now you still got to sue them. They don't make it easy, okay. But but they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna there's no way that you have to sign a visual order in Louisiana. That's clear. Okay. All right, let's do some math real quick. A UDI is called a unit decimal interest. That equals your mineral interest times track participation factor. Your track participation factor is a fancy set of words for how much is your track divided by the total unit acreage, okay? That's, that's your track. That's what share your track is getting of unitized substances, okay? So mineral interest is your, like, you know, I got half the minerals under the 40. That's 20 acres. One half. Practice at least royalty. We all know what that is. Okay, so here we go. You got only 20 net mineral acres under 40 net mineral acres. Under 40 gross. That should be gross. Inside the round unit, which is a triple decker section unit, three sections. Total acres in the unit are 1920. That's if the sections are regular now. We know they're not regular. Okay. But whatever that number is, is, and you lease to the company for, for a fifth or a 20%. So you take your your mineral interest is 20 divided by 40, that's half. Your track participation factor is 40 divided by 1920, that's 0.02083. Your lease royalty is one fifth. Answer is one half times this figure times 0.2 equals 0 0.002083. And then if you want to figure out roughly how many royalty acres that is, you multiply it back times 1920 times the 8, you have 32 royalty acres in that unit, okay? Y'all can look at this later, and it'll soak in a little better, okay? How to convert mineral acres to royalty acres. Because the way royalty sold in our business is it's a one-eighth deal. It's a commodity deal. It's, it's, it's how people can arrive at a valuation. Because if somebody says, if you ask somebody, you want to buy royalty, how much are you paying per royalty acre? That's going to differ from how much you're paying per mineral acre. The mineral acre price always better be better than the royalty acre price unless you lease for less than an eight. And that's not likely to happen. So here's how you trans translate your mineral acres into royalty acres. You take a, a mineral acre is one acre of land leased or unleased. A royalty acre is equal to one eighth of a mineral acre free of the cost of production. Royalty acres exist to provide a fixed commodity, I just said that, which is resulted from the lease and and is, can, can be converted for mineral acres as follows. One mineral acre times eight equals eight royalty acres times the royalty. So that, that, the one mineral acre times eight, that's eight, times this royalty figure, that's the number of royalty acres you have in the acre, okay? Then what you do is you say, once again, we get the same example. You own 20 mineral acres under 40 gross. 
in the brown. Leaves for one-fifth royalty. How many royalty does he own? Well, 20 times 8 times one-fifth is 32. If you have a 3 16 royalty, if the formula is simple, 20 times 8 times 3 16 is 30 royalty acres. See how as your royalty goes down, you got less mineral royalty acres to play with. If you have a fit, uh, well, uh, I've screwed it up down here. This should be a sixth. Okay, that's a screw up. If you go to a sixth royalty, it drops from 32 to 30 to 26.67. Everybody follow that? That's a boo-boo. All right. The market for buying and what you can expect. There, there's a bunch of people out there buying royalty and minerals. Some of them are fully vested in the play. Some are not. Some are just doing mail, you know, mail order stuff, and they're really not embedded in the play with a full staff working this stuff like a real business. They're called primary purchasers. Our company's an example of that. Although sometimes we're in the secondary market too. Primary purchasers are companies who have a staff dedicated to the evaluation purchase of primary ground floor investments in the play. It's tricky because there are two types of primary purchases. People who buy to keep the stuff in a portfolio to, for their children's children generally because they're trying to build an investment into wealth over time, taking into account the risk. Risk goes down when you have lots of eggs in your basket. If you have one egg in your basket, there's a lot of risk. But the reason we can afford to do what we do is because we buy lots of stuff. So the stuff that doesn't pan out is made up by the stuff that does pan out, that kind of thing. Secondary purchasers are the same too, except they're companies who are buying interest from, from companies like us, if we're in the business of what's called flipping the acreage. People who flip acreage are making money on each transaction. And I'm not saying they're to be avoided, but that's, that's not the best place for you all to be dealing with, people who want to monetize their debts. So tertiary persons, per person just buy from this group, and these are people, these are the so-called funny money, these are the hedge funds, the insurance companies, people who are into long-term investments, you know. They're not down here on the floor, they're not in the courthouses, they don't have staff doing this stuff, and they're, you're liable not to run into them. So that's just something to consider. Here's, here's a slide on the ultimate value of a royalty acre. And this is very, very rough. But they're saying these wells are going to do 600,000 barrels of oil. So here's where you go. You go 600,000 barrels times eight. That's going to be the number of wells on a, on, a, on a given unit, for lack of a better, better amount of wells. Some are going to be 10. Some are going to be eight. Some are going to be less. But you do the math, and if you take a $90 barrel oil price, each unit could potentially make 432,000 barrel dollars, okay? So if you take a royalty acre and you do the math right here, one royalty acre divided by the total number of, of royalty acres is what your royalty acre is worth. Remember, 1,920 acres in the unit times eight, that's the total number of royalty acres. If you have one of those, it's 115,360, okay? You just got to follow the math. So you're getting this. One royalty acre gives you six hundred thousandths of whatever that is of a, of a percent, okay? And then you do the math, and then on a good day, over the life of all of the unit, all the wells being drilled with these assumptions down here in the footnotes I've put, a well, a, a royalty acre might be worth over time twenty-eight thousand dollars, maybe. Okay, just to give you a rough idea. Not to say it's going to happen. Not to say your children are going to be alive when it happens, but it's just something to go by. All right, and finally, here's here are the ranges we sit. For leases, I've seen anywhere from $250 to $600 an acre. Okay, I don't know what you guys are seeing. Anybody want to share some numbers? $75 for a start. $75? That's low. Is that three years? Yeah, this is for a three-year lease. You know? Uh, Goodrich is still stuck down 350 something like that. So money's not everything on the front end. There's some of these companies that come in, they've paid high dollars for the leases, they've paid people more royalty than they can afford to, to do, and they get caught with, with holding the bait. You know? uh, for, 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 for minerals, 
if you're out in ram pasture land and there's no unit and you're on the you know near the, the red civic line you'd be lucky to get eight hundred dollars a middle lake if you're underneath the offset to the crosby with the well drilling at, at td being fracked you're liable to get 3200 somewhere in that range if you get more good for you huh what, what you you're like way over <laughs> so with royalty, with royalty, remember it's less. Okay, so 500 to 2,000 a roll taker. That's that's roughly what is reasonable these days out there. Now, if you're getting a lot more than that, I can stand corrected, but I, I've been paying attention. So these are kind of your ranges out there, depending on. And, and what does it depend on? Remember, location, location, location. Would you probably be worth? Uh, more on the lease if it's empty land as opposed to timber? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So the frack, the, the, the lateral doesn't see anything. Yeah. They just want that seven acres to base everything out. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's important for them to get their drill sites in the right spots. So, and right now they look like they're drilling from the middle of the middle section of a triple decker going either direction. That seems to be the goal. Um, this is what you have to do. This is the new TMS Horizons website mineral page, how it's going to work. Basically, what's going to happen is when you call up and say, I need, I want to try to find out what the market will bear on my minerals or my roll, okay? We're going to ask you to probably sign a listing agreement, okay, that gives us a reasonable amount of time to exclusively market that for you. We're not going to hold you up forever, but if we're going to go try to find a buyer for you and do all the work associated with it, with these things, getting these things done, then we're going to want a listing agreement at some point. This is all kind of being developed right now. So we're going to assess the minerals and the royalties and advise you accordingly of where we think you stand, okay? And help you get to a price that you're comfortable with that we think the market will bear. It doesn't do any good if you ask for the sun, the moon, and the stars because the buyers are going to come to us and they're going to come and they're going to say, well, You've got a lot of good stuff up on your website, but all of it's outrageously priced, okay? So there has to be a reality in, in some of this stuff. So we're going to help you get to that. Um, so we'll find a buyer for your assets, market if we need to, to our exclusive list of buyers. Plus, we're going to have the website up there. It's already garnering attention. This is the way where you might get some of those tertiary companies if we can get them looking at the website. They might say, well, I don't have a lot of overhead down here. I can pay more. And they might come and pay more than what the going rate is down here. That's, a, that's the idea in principle, OK? OK, a lot of steps to this. You have to market. You got to interface between the buyer and seller, orchestrate the purchase and sale agreements, clear the title, do all that stuff, get you a check. That's the idea. And you'll be asked to pay a commission of some, some reasonable amount. But you'll be happy because you'll have gotten what you want, okay? And we all know that when we sell our houses, you got to pay a commission. This is no different. It's a real estate deal, okay? That's it. Sorry for keeping so long. Thank you.